uh, regular session of the California right. Commission to order on February 22nd. Roll call. Dominic Johnson, Williams, Here. Lynn, Here. Bowman, Here. Baker, Lynch, Escadet, Thibodeau, Here. Cox, Smith, Epperson. We have a quorum, Mr. President. All the way down here. All right. Yeah. Uh, indication by <coughs> Mr. Escobar and our pledge will be by Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams. Bow your heads. Heavenly Father, look upon us this day and help us to do the work that we're here to do, representing the people, trying to make the parish better, a better place. Let's give blessings on our nation, special blessings on all those in the military who defend us every day and put everything on the line as well as bless their families who support them in their endeavors. Yes. Help us to remain free and prosperous nation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Jesus Amen. 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 Turn and face the flag and render the proper salute to the flag and repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So, do we have any agenda additions? <coughs> see any <coughs> citizens' comments? Uh, citizens who wish to address the commission on any issue other than zoning, please fill out a comment card located in the chamber for you and refer return to the president or the clerk of the commission. Individual comments are limited to three minutes. And um, I have one. Uh, Dinah Sal. Hello. Hi, good afternoon. Address. Name and address, please. Dinah Sal at um, 1672 David Rains Apartments, King Manors 2, Shreveport. Um, I recently moved here to Shreveport from Fort Lauderdale and uh, notice there's a vast difference in uh, code enforcement and the quality of living. But um, it was very difficult getting someone on the phone to help me deal with the um, apartment complex that I was living at. And so finally, after calling maybe 15 people, I've got um, Mr. Michael Williams on the phone. And I found him to be very helpful in um, communicating with the um, business that I was dealing with. Right, did you did you finally get your problem handled? Very fast. I mean, it took me two, three days to get the right person on the phone. But finally, when I spoke to Mr. Michael Williams, things were done quick, fast, and in a hurry. Found that um, he did a very great job representing his his town. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. That's thank you, Mr. Williams. I was, thank you for coming, Dana. Uh, Dana had a problem with her uh, a landlord. She just moved her, like she said, from another uh, state that has different ordinance and codes. Uh, she had been there for three days and signed a lease, but they, when they signed the lease, they showed the apartment at night. Showed the apartment at night, and recognized that the apartment had a, several deficiencies. Uh, even the roach was small enough to come out in 48 hours. <laughs> and she called me with her problem, and she said she wanted to break her lease, and she had paid approximately two thousand dollars down for her apartment. Well, we're not pleased. So I so kindly called the management, the management of the owner in New York. And we kind of uh, struck a compromise where she's getting almost 80% of the money back. And I, I think that that was something she was uh, really happy about because she had nowhere to turn to, nowhere to go. Absolutely nowhere. I mean, um, many people, um, I was told that yesterday was a holiday that most of the um, United States do not celebrate, which is Fat Tuesday. And um, phones just rang yesterday, and today I was put on hold many times. So I found the um, government here to be very inefficient up until the time I spoke to Mr. Michael Williams. Because in Florida, there's only one number you call, and w uh, within an hour, they're there at the building inspecting and shutting things down and getting things done. But um, it was very hard to get things done here. In the city of Shreveport, I found you guys to be like maybe a thousand years behind. Um, the stuff that was going on in Florida, a thousand years at least. And as soon as I spoke to Mr. Michael Williams, things got done. And I do appreciate you, sir, because without you, I don't know what I'd be doing right now. I'd still be calling and I'd probably be on hold as of right now. 
waiting to speak to someone. So I think, but one, I would make one recommendation that you guys should probably communicate with cities outside of Louisiana to see how they're doing things because they are extremely efficient. Thank you. Maybe if you guys can take some examples from them. Mm -hmm. I mean, you'd find there's an easier way of getting things done. Thank you, ma'am. That um, help the community and individuals. Thank because you. other than that, I've just been dealing with ringing phones <laughs> and placed on hold. May I ask you a question? Now, is this apartment that you were uh, thinking about uh, leasing, was that in the city? Of Shreveport, yes. You were calling the city? Yes, I was calling the response? city. Um, I'm told that you guys don't have code enforcement for apartments in the books yet, and you guys are working on that? Well, the city's working on that. So we're, I just want to let you understand, I thought Mr. Williams was gener very generous and, and gracious to help you. Uh, our jurisdiction on those kind of things, for the most part, lies outside of the corporate limits of the city. So we are a lot faster and a lot more reactive when we have the authority and jurisdiction in the city. But I know the city council and the mayor are working working on those ordinances right now to, to protect people who are leasing property. I understand that. And as I noted is that many other cities already have these things in the books. You guys are getting these things in the books. <laughs> but other cities have it already in the books for well, yes, years what now. I'm trying to explain, that, was, that was my only point. But I'm, what I'm trying to explain to you, too, is <clears throat> we're not the city. We, this body, mm -hmm. not enact those codes, those ordinances, those provisions, nor enforce them. You know, we're happy to help, but we just want you to understand that the jurisdiction lies with the city and the city council. We're the governing county official, basically, if you're not used to okay, the word county parish. Okay, parish. Yeah. Yes, but we're yes. happy to help, but the city is going to have to resolve those issues. And we're happy to work with them and we work with them on all the times on issues for the common good. And, and we'll continue to pursue that and work with them so that no one else experiences these problems. Okay, thank you for your help. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks again, Mr. Michael William. Thank you, ma'am. All right, we have visitors. Um, Surprise. Ms. Cox, Ted Cox, with the County Parish Juvenile Court Administrator. Mr. President, thank you um, for the opportunity to let me speak, particularly uh, Mr. Escadet, who put me on the um, agenda. Let me just tell you how I got here as far as kind of the scenario of events. Right after I found out that uh, Commissioner Lynch was uh, the chairman of the Juvenile Justice Committee, uh, I gave her a call and we talked about some different programs. One program that's uh, high on our list is the Facts of Life program. And I asked her if there would be perhaps uh, an opportunity where they would have a meeting with the Juvenile Justice Committee and, and we would like to see whether or not we could get uh, sponsorship of this particular program. And I know we've been back and forth on this program a couple of times. And all due respect with her, and she's not here, but uh, she said that she's looking for a long-term solution, which is the ideal solution as far as being able to fund different programs but she was not in favor of a, a piecemeal type program. And I understand that. I mean, ideally, she's, she's absolutely correct. We do need to find a long-term solution. But we came in front of you, I think it was back during November. Uh, Rick Foreman is the executive director of the uh, Volunteers for Youth Justice. This program that we're trying to keep alive, the Facts of Life program, has been an excellent program. We've got uh, great statistics as far as recidivism. Recidivism rate is very low in this program. And we've been able to, uh, through the help of uh, 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 Mr. Walker, we've been able to show that the, there's been a reduction in the number of youth that have been placed in the detention center because of this program. So what I'm asking for, uh, through Judge Matlock, Judge Young, and Judge Stone, is $35,000 that we will keep this program afloat until the end of June where we'll have the opportunity to sit down and come up with some kind of long-term strategy and hopefully we can convince uh, folks this is such a good program that we can fund it again for a full year. Again, uh, I know Judge Matlock was uh, talking to Erica this morning about some of the, the funding issues and we understand the state's cutting back on uh, the funding through the Office of Juvenile Justice and the uh, Office of uh, Mental Health. But this is one program that we do have accurate statistics on, and it has been an excellent program. Uh, recidivism is, is very low. I'm not sure just what the next step needs to be, but uh, I am requesting through the juvenile court that uh, we can get this bridge funding, so to speak, as we've labeled it, to uh, help us through the end of the uh, state's fiscal year. 
and then from there we'll just have to take a look and see if we can continue the program and there's a possibility unfortunately we may not be able to continue the program but right now this program is working and it's keeping young people out of detention and when when will this current funding in well funding is already ended for right now for for the youth challenge i mean uh, for the uh, uh, volunteers for youth justice facts of life program it's uh right now the funding for january and february being funded by uh, the judges through their judicial expense fund. Uh, you know, I'm, need be, we're going to try to find the funding for, uh, the judges try to find the funding through March, but uh, we're looking, you know, to see if we can get the $35,000, which will carry us through the end of the fiscal year, the end of June. Mr. Uh, Mr. Dominic, um, just a couple questions. So the, the judicial fund, the judge's fund is in the, the January and February, is that correct? Uh, yes, we're in the same, what, uh, the fiscal, we're, we're in the calendar year with, what with was the commission. The, the last thing I remember, we were here in November, did we fund it through December? Yes, sir. Uh, yes. And that was what, through August through that December? That was August through December. You went, uh, and went back. I think we talked to... about re-looking at this at the first of the year. I can't remember all the details, but... You know, we're going to look at the first of the year, which is already after the first of the year, to see how long we need to get it funded. And we're hoping to get some funds through the state. Of course, I guess what you're saying is the state appears they're going to cut all of this stuff out. Well, we, there was a possibility that we might be able to get some funding through economic development. That, that didn't happen. So and Basically, what you're asking is some funding to allow it for a bridge from uh, March, April, May, and June until right. it gives us time to look at this to see if we can come up with a long-term solution. Of course, I know a lot of the commissioners have some issues with we have so many different programs, whether it's facts of life or something else, uh, and it seems like something always is getting added on. Which, which are the good ones, and how can we um, ultimately solve this solution? I guess that's what we're talking about right now, it's a well, long-term solution. Commissioner Lynn had a, 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 has a great suggestion. He wants to be able to see the stats on all the programs. Sure, I would and think. Unfortunately, we, right now, our database doesn't allow for that. But again, uh, Mr. Walker is making, looking into making some adjustments so we can get the stats that you need on all the programs. That way we can take a good, good hard look to see whether or not uh, the other programs, you know, just how good the other programs are compared to, to the facts of life. The reason we have such accurate stats on the facts of life it's because Volunteers for Youth Justice is hand counting and going in and checking to see whether or not kids have go back in and, and commit another crime. So we know those those stats are very, very accurate. And I mean, Charles' opinion, of course, we rely a, a lot on you guys, Mr. Foreman. If this is not done, then we're going to be looking at a higher bed camp or more people. Well, I don't want to come right out and say that. That's, you know, we hope that, you know, the, you know, the judges have, have worked very closely with, with juvenile services to keep that number. Yeah, right now, I think the average is, maybe Clay can, can back me up on this, the average has been 21-22, where two years ago there were 40, 42 kids in there. Uh, I'm just saying as we lose certain programs, Facts of Life being one, and the Office of Juvenile Justice cutting back some of the, their funding on programs, there's a possibility that you could see a rise in the uh, number of kids going into the detention center. Um, but I'm not hanging that out there saying if you don't fund this program. I understand. I was just, yeah. I mean, ask you for your you know, opinion on that or what you thought. You explained it. I don't have anything else at this time, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Cox, what, Sir. Does, what, does it, what is the formula, what does it cost per inmate uh, at your facility? Well, I, do, I probably need to defer to Mr. Clay Walker on that. Uh, he's the Director of Juvenile Services. Uh, I, with this, let, let me let him speak. I don't want to have it down by now. Well, I do have it, but I don't want to speak for Juvenile Services. We run that facility now. We run the facility. Somewhere just below $200, between $180 and about $230 a day, depending on the level of medication a child would need. So what time a year will we talk? Just a year. What is one inmate a year? One inmate a year would be, oh, time, we don't keep kids for a year, so I don't know on an annual basis, but 200 to $230 a day. Hmm. We keep kids an average of 9.6 days. So they're, they're not very, very long, but 
but it is relatively expensive. A lot of these alternative to incarceration uh, help, help free up the beds for the most severe offenders. They do. Um, I think a program like this, actually what it would do, probably you're not going to have a Facts of Life kid go to detention, but a Facts of Life program is going to keep the child from reoffending. What you're talking about is a misdemeanor kid that's just running around causing some minor trouble. They get into Facts of Life and they get back on a better path and they don't keep offending over and over. And, uh, is the truancy, social service, how does the family incorporate into that, in the Facts of Life? Program? Very much in, in, in part of it. Everything we do, the parent is involved in the court. The court has the parent, the, the judges have the parent in court. They explain to the parent what the program is and what part they need to play in it. And if they don't, there can be contempt and all sorts of things. So generally, we get pretty good involvement. One of the things uh, we were very instrumental in years ago when I first came here was the, the boot camp program that I had the opportunity to go to Conroe, Texas with the late Johnny Vance. And we brought the boot camp program back here and I returned back to the commission. I hear that that program no longer exists. Uh, the family was cut by the state for that. It's about a four years ago. Well, I, I'll tell you exactly what happened on the front. It was cut by OJJ. We were getting about $300,000 a year. Uh, when they decided to cut the, the program, uh, Judge Matlock got a, literally got a meeting with the governor. We went down to the governor, sat in his little personal office at the mansion and explained to him what a great program it was, showed him all the stats. Uh, you know, had to, you know, I don't know if you, you weren't on the commission at that time, but we've had a couple of parents come up here in front of the commission and explain what a great program it was and how they turned their children around. But uh, the governor said he'd take a look at it and uh, we even talked to Commissioner Paul Rainwater, but they decided that they just didn't, weren't going to give us $300,000. Out of all the programs you do, that's one of the best nationally known programs that actually works, builds discipline, builds character, builds self-esteem, and of course a lot of them young men ain't wearing pajamas. <laughs> Y'all have a good day. Thank you. Uh, before we go any farther with the next speaker, I'll get to them in just a minute. Uh, why don't we go ahead and put this on our work session agenda for March 5th, and I'll have Ms. Lynch meet before that time so that her committee can make a recommendation to us on March 5th. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Ms. Baker? Uh, Mr. Cox, have you talked to, like, anyone about partnering with them for this program? Uh, I was listening to... Um, Ms. Willis from the Community Oriented Policing Department and the Shreveport Police Department, and she's talked about, looks like she had a program that's something similar to this. Maybe it's something that you all can probably partner with them. Well, this is a very structured counseling program. Uh, if we would partner with anybody, the only way we could partner, they'd have to help us fund it. Now, we've taken a look at, you know, grants are not, <clears throat> the amount of grants are not out there like they used to be. And here's a good example. About a week ago, there was a big splash in the paper about how Bossier City got this grant from the Louisiana Commission on Law Enforcement uh, for their diversion program. So I, I'm on the governor's uh, advisory board, and I didn't recall that grant, so I ca called down to Baton Rouge to ask about it. And uh, the lady that I spoke to says, well, this is all it is is J-Big money. You get J-Big money, uh, juvenile accountability uh, grant. And uh, so, actually, what they were doing is just they took their money from one source and applied it to another program. So, uh, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that grant funding is, is really, uh, there's been a tremendous reduction in grant funding. But you're right, I, I could find somebody to be willing to help us kick in and, and run that program, but it's such a structured program, there's, you have to have trained counselors to make the, the presentation to the, to the kids in the class. Well, I also looked, uh, somebody from the uh, state was talking about um, how we have a lot of recidivism programs in place. And I think there's something that they're like pushing. I don't know if it's just for adults or if it's for adults and youth. So that's why I was asking about if you could possibly see if you could probably partner with some of these organizations or see what they have. Or right. uh, Mr. Foreman has been uh, the. Uh, director now how long? Six months. Six months. And he's been very, very aggressive as far as finding grant money. Uh, he's got money through the, the uh, Community Foundation. He just got another grant from, from no. 
United Way. You know, yeah. So, you know, there are, but then again, they run a multitude of programs for us. They run all our, <coughs> our diversion type programs and our fence programs and <coughs> currency. So, uh, this is really the only court program, or the only program that the court has that it can send kids directly to without, as Clay mentioned, without putting them in detention. Thank you, Mr. President. All right, Mr. Lynn and Mr. Estraday. Um, I wanted to touch base on something that you had said, uh, Mr. Cox, in regard that, that two years ago I asked for data on all of the programs that Caddo Parish funds in, in regard to juvenile truancy, recidivism, just all, all the programs that we have out there. And I know that in those last two years, we've hired two people to track statistics. And still in those two years, we still don't have these this information. So as a commissioner, when I'm spending the taxpayers' money for programs to benefit the youth of Caddo Parish, I don't know if I'm spending the taxpayers' money on programs that work, or I don't know if I'm spending the money on taxpayers on programs that don't work. And until all those facts come back, I'm, I'm trusting, which I, and of course certainly we trust you and we trust everybody at the juvenile detention facility. However, the, the numbers aren't there. And if I've been asking for these numbers for two years, what gives? What's a hold up? Well, <clears throat> let me say this. I don't want to speak for Clay, but I'm going to tell you the problem. The problem, it can be laid right in my lap. Four years ago, I agreed with the Supreme Court to take on a free database called IGES. And they said, okay, we're going to make Cattle Parish uh, Court, the, the guinea pig will, will develop a program from the ground up, we'll hand it to you to see how it works. Well, they did. And it's not working like it should. And I must admit, I was the one who raised my hand and said, yes, we'll take this program. Now, since that time, we've been making modifications as we go along. Uh, I'd have to defer to Clay on, on how things are coming here, you know, in the last six months. But there has been some improvement. And I know two years ago you did ask for that information because I recall it. Uh, but we just didn't have the capability to give you that information through the database. Now, some programs with which we hand count, all the programs through Volunteers for Youth Justice we can give you statistics on. But some of those other programs we haven't been able to. Unfortunately, that database and, and the Supreme Court dropped. How long have we had this, this IGES anchor dragging us down? Well, we've, we've had the program almost four years now. And when will we have enough sense to, to cut the cord and disconnect and move on to something that we can, I mean, if we're wasting $50,000 a year on programs that don't work, that could be money that we could double down on a program that does work. And if we don't know the information on what works and doesn't work, then we, we need to be able to know that. And if we need to dump a system and get a system that does work that we can track the facts and the history of the youth, then I think that we need to find out what that first step is on on putting together a system to where we can know if we're spending money on things that work or if we're spending money on things that don't work. And until we do that, then we're just, we're shooting in the dark. Commissioner Liam, if I can address, the JPEG fund is a Supreme Court funded program. It didn't cost us a dime. Is that correct? Yes, sir, it was free. So we didn't, to get we didn't pay for it. I realize that it didn't cost us a dime, however, it's costing us every year for the last four years on funding programs that don't work and it's also costing us every year for funding programs insufficiently that do work and so if there's programs that do work then we need to increase their funding if there's programs that don't work we need to cut them okay and you mentioned also the uh the data analysis folks at mr steve snow that we hired yes they're tracking primarily any casey foundation initiative for us so we can give you all kind of data on that unless there's some, well, some other program beyond that that you need data for. Let's expand their duties. If I may, um, the, the politics behind IGES is that the Supreme Court funds a lot of other things we have. They have influence over our state funding. So we are trying to work with IGES to improve it. It's happening slowly and it may not ever happen. So what we did starting this year, we're doing our own already. You asked me to do it. 
we started it January 1, so we are keeping our own data on it, parallel to trying to work with IGES. We are trying to do our best to work with the state, and if it does come to fruition, great. If it doesn't, we have our own that we started in January of this year, tracking every kid that goes through detention, every kid that comes on probation, every sanction they get, every program they're served that serves them, everything, and we'll track if they ever recommit another crime or come back in on probation, same crime, but come into detention over and over for probation violations. We'll be able to track that to tell you essentially if the kid is <coughs> back on the right track or still on the wrong track. We have that started this year, and what all I was responding to in this was, I don't have any data for you yet. I'm, I'm two months and 22 days, or one month and 22 days in. We really don't have enough data to tell you yet. We'll get it as, as quickly as we can, because like you say, we don't want to wait around to see if I just will work or not. We'll do our best to help to work with the state, but if not, we have our own. And so we've got a system in place now and everything's going to be smooth and we'll have data on everything in three months, six months. I could give you a quarterly report, I could give you a six month report, you're probably going to need, I would say, at least an 18 month report to say if something's effective or not. You want to track a kid that graduates from Facts of Life, how does he do for 18 months? That's something where it's going to sustain. He may be able to keep together for a month, let's see, I can give you month to month how they're doing, I just so as, we have, as soon so as we have the data. 16 months for good data. That would give us, that would give us much better data at the end of 16, at eight, yes. At the end of 18 months, 16 months total. But be what, but uh, facts of life data, we can give you that today from when the program first started. Yes, I realize that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Esperley. Okay, so you're saying you have the data gathering situation resolved. Is that what I'm hearing you say? I wouldn't say it's resolved. We've got a, a, a spreadsheet data collection system that we created because we can't wait for IGES. It's not a database that we would purchase um, that probably would give us better results, but those are quite expensive. So you're manually collecting information and putting it on spreadsheets, basically? Yes. And the two people that are collecting this data, um, I mean, you know, just be candid. I mean, you know, they're working eight hours a day? Yes. Steady on it? No, not. it doesn't take all that time. What else they do? Lot, well, other data, um, they're, they're collecting things. We, we try to break down um, every child that's arrested in a school-related incident. We try to break down by zip codes. We try to break down lots of different things so that we can be talking with the decision makers about what we do. Um, if there are particular neighborhoods or schools or things that need to be addressed, we're going to try to collect the data for you. Well, in, in light of that, you know, um, First of all, I want to commend you because, you know, a few years back we were talking about average <clears throat> detainees were 42 and we've cut that in half and that is a good thing. I don't think that uh, I understand it, but maybe uh, <clears throat> you guys, not blaming you like you guys, but maybe you haven't <clears throat> uh, done as good a job explaining to us in detail about what has <clears throat> Been achieved by lowering the the average uh, inmate population. I think that you know when people tend to think a lot of times that once you oh, if we've cut it in half, and they think your expenses cut in half, and that's that's not the case because your fixed expenses, your personnel doesn't change. No matter whether you have one or twenty, you got the same amount of guards and all. You know, some people understand it, some don't. So I don't know that you've made your case uh, in explaining you know, the savings and how it was realized and why it was what it was and not more. And I think once people understand that, then they realize, well, okay, we've made progress. I imagine uh, the only thing that you can really save on with your population cut in half, naturally, is the meds and the food and, and, and personal supplies. That's, that's about it. That's it. Uh, but the rest of the expenses, the utilities, the electricity, the salary, they go on and, and they don't go away. And it's not to say that it's a bad thing. The good thing is the number is down. Um, but I'm like Mr. Lynn, I want to continue to support these programs, but we have to know whether we're making the best use of our money. And if you say it's going to be 18 months before we get good data, and we're going to go through this again next budget year, and we're going to be sitting here wondering what works, and you're going to ask for funding for the program, and we're just going to be shooting, shooting in the dark. And I don't want to wait 18 months 
I truly don't. Um, and it may be uh, impossible for you to come up with that data. Ultimately, what I'd like to see us do, and I've had this private conversation, is that we look at our total investment, our annual investment with you guys on these type of programs, and once we have determined what works, and then on an annual basis, allocate you those funds and let you determine where you're going to put them. Because we're not in it day to day, you know, we don't have the, the data, the knowledge, we don't know what works, rather than, uh, you know, this is kind of a shotgun approach and it's always an emergency approach, we've got this crisis or that crisis. I would rather try to get some hard data and initially get that number of what it's going to take to support your efforts, which are showing progress, I admit that, and I'm all for that, I want to continue it. And, and identify that finite source of money and annually appropriate it to you and say, Clay, Ted, you guys, it's your ball. And here, you spend it where you think it needs to be be uh, spent best and we want to see continued improvement, you know. But that, that's where I'd like to go with it. Uh, whether or not the committee meets or not, I'll tell you right now, I'll go ahead and sponsor an ordinance to get you uh, your money. For, for the next few months to continue this program. I don't want to drop the ball on it, then we've lost, then we've lost data. You know, uh, I, I like the program personally. You, uh, the parental involvement aspect is something that appeals to me, that the parents have to be involved, to follow up, to, to uh, work with their child to keep them on the road from, from being a repeat offender. As Michael can probably tell you and the rest of us, when we grew up, uh, you know, the facts of life were, you know, when the cops brought us home, they left the facts life were explained to us on the strap of the belt Amen. and uh, nobody had to tell our parents they need to do that but this is a different day and time and uh, you know we, we need to take a different approach but I want to continue to see this go I, I believe in the program I want to get the bridge funding in place have us some hard numbers I would ask you had some hard numbers by June on, on the specifics of this program and I would urge you well before our budget process begins next year to have as much of that hard data and information on the programs that you have, the success rates, and, and what's most important to you guys so that we're not here again next year uh, and, and we can do something reasonable and like I said, fund you annually and unless you have a crisis or an emergency or something, let you do your jobs which you do well and so that we can work on other, other things and, and not directly be in your business. but. Uh, and I also, too, want to point out and apologize that I think personally, I'm not speaking about anybody, it just doesn't matter if they're not here, that uh, especially an agency that's uh, part of the parish and related to the parish, that uh, I, th I think it's uh, really just ashamed that you can't, you, you couldn't get your uh, request put on an agenda for a committee meeting. I mean, the, our committee meetings and our public meetings here, the forum for the general public, for our entities who are associated and working with us, whether it be juvenile justice or the district courts or anybody else, to to advocate their case and have the people's voice heard. And I don't think anybody should be not denied anything in a committee. And I just want to let you know, I'm, I'm sorry that happened. I'm kind of disgusted with it. And I would encourage all of those who sit on this body who chair committees that, uh, you know, it's not our meeting. It is the, there are public meetings and, and anybody should be able to bring anything to the table. Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> that's why I wanted this to go before the committee because it's not the chairperson's responsibility of any committee to determine what comes to that committee or what doesn't. If it fits within those uh, parameters, then that committee needs to hear it, regardless of how the chairperson feels about it. <clears throat> and I, I would hope uh, that if you have an ordinance, if you could have it written in time for the committee to take a look at it, just so that we can say we went through the normal process with it. And I just have one other thing I, I want to say. Please, and, and I found this to be epidemic, I, and I'll, I'll use it in government, and with the school system, with government in general, with, with juvenile, everybody has 500 programs, but seldom, very seldom, do you ever get the results of the program. And I, I mean, if this is from private business, your job would depend on how well that program did. But it seems like because it's other people's money that government doesn't seem to operate very well. They just want another program. 
And so I'm, I'm saying for this one commissioner here, if you ever let <coughs> another program and you bring it before us, please have a portion in there that is set up to do reporting and give accurate results, or I don't even want to see it myself. Um, and I can't picture anyone who is in charge of a program that can't tell you after a month or two if that program is being successful or not. Uh, it's like going to the doctor, and the doctor says, I have this new medication. I have no idea if it's going to work, but, I, but, but it's the only medication we can give you. So he keeps giving it to his patients, and he, if he doesn't check to see if they're dying or getting worse, and he just keeps giving them that medication, we got a problem. And that's in essence what I think government programs do a lot of times. Nobody checks to see if they really work. So that's my speech for today. <laughs> Just um, Commissioner Williams, uh, if you can talk Eric and give me three hundred fifty thousand dollars. I'll start to start the boot camp up next month. Yeah, we will we'll, we'll work on it. Okay, okay special uh, resolutions. So a resolution of recognition for Terry Camp, general manager of the Radio Group and KA Ka Radio. Come on, Chair. Second. All right. A motion by Mr. Williams, second by Mr. Dominic. Uh, Cast your vote, please. And <coughs> Mr. Williams, you're going to make the presentation. You're going to read the resolution. Okay. Oh. Read it. Would you would stand with me. And, uh, is Mr. Giles here? Yeah. Okay. There he is. Okay. Okay. Brother Jack. Mr. Giles. <coughs> In the name and by the authority of the Cattle Parish Commission. Proclamation of recognition and congratulations to KO, KA 980, The Light, AM Radio, and Kerry Camp, General Manager of the Radio Group. Whereas the Caddo Parish Commission is always pleased to extend appropriate recognition and commendation to the organizations and institutions which undergird the social fabric of this community and to acknowledge the important events and milestones which occur within their corporate existence. And whereas such an institution as KOKA, the light, 980 AM radio, and Kerry Camp, general manager of the radio group of Shreveport, which is celebrating their successful stellar gospel music award for small market radio stations for the year 2011. And whereas KOKA radio has garnered the award designed to honor those who, who play a major role in the delivery of gospel music by helping to foster the steady increase in the demand for gospel music. One area decided among many in 2011 after four years of nominations in KOKA's selection was their community outreach to Shreveport Bossier and its citizens. And whereas remarkably during the past 39 years, KOKA has remained the gospel leader in Arbitron ratings for a consecutive 22 years and has prevailed as one of the top four local radio stations throughout the years. <clears throat> Excuse me. Whereas much of KOK's success can be attributed to their program director, Dr. Albert Eddie Giles, and to Mr. Kerry Camp, general manager of the radio group, Mr. Camp's dedication to Shreveport and Cattle Parish has been apparent over the years with his many hours of community and organ organizational service. Mr. Camp and the radio group have received many accolades over the years in the radio industry, <coughs> but along with this award, his proudest moments have always been service to the community, his school, and his church. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Cattle Parish Commission meeting in legal and regular session this 22nd day of February, 2012, that does hereby extend its heartiest expressions of congratulations to KOKA 980 AM and the Kerry Camp, the radio group general manager, for receiving the Stellar Gospel Award for small market radio stations, thereby bringing attention to an activity and business that entertained, elevated, and enriched this community. Signed, Michael Thibodeau, President, Lindora Baker, Vice President, Michael Williams, District 3. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Let's say on behalf of the commission body, the president and the vice president and the rest of the body, uh, I want to say thank you to your organization, to, Mr. to the radio group, to you, uh, Dr. Giles, and to your wife for all the fine work that you do in our community oftentimes go unnoticed. Uh, I think the radio group 
their message rings out not only just in Louisiana, but Texas and the architect, providing the community service that you've been providing for our community over the years. And I just want to say thank you and recognize you. Oftentimes, we don't take care of our home at home and for the award that you received. So thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me apologize for my lateness, and I have my lovely wife and son with me here. But let me say to the chairman and parish commissioners, on behalf of uh, Mr. Kerry D. Kent, who is out of town and all the staff and management at the radio group, 980 AM KOKA, I would like to thank you for all your recognition of this Achievement Award on which we are extremely grateful. And the Stella Award is the Grammy of Gospel Music. It's the uh, pinnacle to which all aspire in gospel music industry. And to have this achievement or this uh, milestone in, in, the, in the huge of our heartwarming uh, acknowledgement that we feel here today by our parish government uh, on this, on Friday, we would like to say, March 16th at 6.30 p.m., we will host an event entitled Celebration of a Stellar Moment, where we would, uh, would like to invite all of you to come and share with us. It will be at Praise Temple, Full Gospel Baptist Church, 4725 Greenwood Road, Bishop Larry L. Brandon, a pastor, and we invite you all to come. And again, as program director and music director of the Stella Award Radio Station, the Stella Award Radio Station, the light, 980 AM KOKA. Thank you. Thank you. I would love for you to just at least feel <coughs> this award. All you. right. How can I get one of those? I got to sing? <laughs> <laughs> I ain't gonna make it. You did it for not singing. <laughs> we'll give you one just for being quiet. We're gonna take you a picture. Uh -huh. Matthew, take a picture for you. <laughs> yeah. Paul's father, turn around that one. <laughs> 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 Go put that on his Facebook page tonight. You watch it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, let me get oh, mine. I got, I got you in the train up here. All right, turn around. I like to thank my family and my friends. <laughs> this is going to be all over Facebook. <laughs> but I never get a chance to get one of these. That's nice. Yeah, it's pretty good. Cool. It's beautiful. Go ahead. It's heavy. Yeah, it is. <coughs> Don't give it to George. She might throw it at somebody. Then. <laughs> Go on, man. That's Gospel Grammy. Gospel Grammy. Okay. Right. That's I'm nice. Out of here. It's neat. Can I do a World of Hundred Thanks yeah. for letting us paw your Grammy. Chair, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Communication committee reports. I've got Commissioner Williams. I'd like to recognize uh, as our commission clerk will read off Mr. Rodney White. I'm glad he's here. He had a, a, a recent death in his family. He took the time to come and be with us, and I'm very grateful that he's here. Would you like to read that, Mr. Clerk, sure. real quickly? Yes, sir. In the name and by the authority of the Cattle Parish Commission, know ye that whereas on the 22nd day of February 2012, this District 3 Small Business Owner Award is presented to 
Mr. Robin White, White's Printing, for his forceful and dynamic commercial presence in the community and for the contributions he has made to the economic development and well-being of the area. Signed, Michael D. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Commissioner White and his family have been a cornerstone uh, in the African American community on providing printing. A lot of us running for public office, and a lot of churches and other events have benefited from the fine work and graphic uh, that they do in our community. And if we're looking to partner up with your uh, administrator, uh, someone that want to be on the uh, parish uh, DBA program or amend the name you're going to change. I think Mr. White would be a worthwhile uh, project to uh, work with and consider. So hopefully you would meet with him and look at some of his work and let's get him involved. Thank you again, Mr. White. Thank you. I would like to say, and thank you first of all for recognizing, uh, White's Printing is one of the oldest existing printing business in Shreveport and probably the oldest minority printing business here in Shreveport and actually was pretty much sustained and ran by my mom who actually started the business back in the 50s which was kind of unheard of a black female running a business and nevertheless a printing business which is a non-traditional uh, African-American uh, line of work and in lieu of her passing at the age of 95, we just funeralized her Sunday, Saturday. I take this as a honor and a recognition of her many years of labor and hard work to the community. And thank you guys very much. Sure, thank you. Uh, we're still on communication, community reports at the... Any other communications? No, just, I just, I just, we don't have any today, sir. All right. Mr. Chairman, I just want to William. continue with um, what we did the other day with a particular ordinance that I personally with because most of you know I'm passionate about things when I take on a project and I'm not posturing for any attention or any media or any exposure. Because I am concerned about the plight of America, but most of all, I'm concerned about the plight of our youth and our children. And this country does need an extreme makeover in certain parts of our country. Because now we live in a Facebook, fiber optic, iPod, computeristic society. A lot of our children didn't get the values that Commissioner Epson, Commissioner Eskaday and I came upon. But we only had three sets of rules. You had school clothes, you had church clothes, and you had play clothes. And we had those traditional conservative values that made me the man that I am today because we was a village child and we all cared about each other. If ever this country needs, it needs healing, it needs love, and it needs compassion. And a lot, of, a lot of the things that we're seeing in our schools, in our community, in our churches, in our shopping centers, they're despicable, they're despicable. That was the time when I grew up when you saw pajamas being worn in the public. We were taught to wear your pajamas at home. The government had always intervened in our lives because if it had not been for government, I wouldn't even have the right to vote. I wouldn't even have the Human Rights Act, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act. So government had always intervened when a time when they saw a need. I never thought this day and time that you have heavy hand government getting in the business of people. And maybe I don't know, I don't know the direction we should go. But we all agree we do have a problem. We do have a problem with our with our society and how we dress. Even in Chicago, you can't fish in pajamas. Even in Hawaii, you can't wear only just swimming trunks in Hawaii. Even in Colorado, you have an obscenity law where you can't just walk around with anything that's unbecoming. Even in Ireland, they are forming a pajama law. Even in the UK, they even perform a pajama, pajama law. And most of this stuff is made, not made in America. Not even made in American soil. We got foreign products on American soil. Not only are they poisoning our kids, they're taking our jobs too. And most of the patrons that are buying these products would love to shop in our stores. Sometimes they don't shop because they see this hip hop generation have taken advantage of the Constitution. And also it's a health hazard. Oftentimes when you go and put on pajamas, most of the time you haven't taken a bath. Your personal hygiene, the public safety, 
but checking the environment is important. What is it going to have to take? Some type of bacterial infection from somebody's skin and somebody has to die? So I always like to take a proactive approach and not a reactive approach to save the quality of life and protect the environment. And, uh, and today other day when I asked my colleagues, would you just consider the professional courtesy and allow some to come before the public so the public can have some input? And that's what we was talking about today when Commissioner Essendon said that the public ought to have input on matters to the to the to the to the to their concern. The people voices ought to be heard, not cut off the date. Whether you for it or against it, allow me to have at least my day in court. I'm not committing a crime. What I'm talking about is not a crime. What I'm talking about is concern about the direction this country is going in. And hopefully uh, I get that opportunity again in the future. I don't know what we do it through a resolution. I'm going to consider to pursue my campaign or letter writing campaign, writing the President of the United States of America, writing our governor. Uh, writing the corporate CEOs of some of these major companies, getting them involved. If we can't legislate, at least we can educate about the future of America. It's doing it away in a moral fiber as it can. <clears throat> Not only is it a moral issue, it also is a safety issue. Not only is it a safety issue, but the products are not even made in America. They're made on foreign soil. When we go to other countries, we adopt their rules and regulations. They do what the Romans do in Rome. What Iran do in Iran and Pakistan, we do in other places. But let's adopt what America does here. So hopefully I will be pursuing this in the future. I have received a lot of positive phone calls from the public telling me keep up the good work, keep up the good job, and I will continue to be a drum major to ensure that we restore the American values in our community. Thank you. Yeah, Ms. Bowman? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and I just want to make a brief statement because it's not my goal to uh, sit here and try to oppose uh, Commissioner Williams. He has every right to bring forward whatever he would um, so chooses as well as any other commissioner here. But I have the same right to disagree, same right to oppose, and, and that's where I was yesterday where I was a few weeks ago and a month ago, and that's where I am today. Um, it's not a matter of not wanting to see someone bring an issue forward or one way or the other, but I have that right just as well as in, in anybody else. We all do. Um, I've always believed that morals are taught at home. Sunday school, uh, in the church maybe, and ironically, where we are at this day and age, we don't have the village that we used to have that raised our children, helped to raise um, children, especially when we were kids. Um, <coughs> I am one that always uh, tell people about uh, one of our neighbors, uh, we called her my sister and most of the kids in the neighborhood called her Nosy Dora. But it was never a time my mother left and she saw us do something. She came and let us know first that we were wrong. Then she told our parents on us. And, and you just don't have that. And, and it's not my job. It's, I don't feel and I don't feel that it is the police nor the sheriff's job to be fashion police when we have so much other stuff going on in not only the city but the parish as well. When we look at the fact that you've got um, just night before last, I think there were eight different call-ins, shootings in different sections of the city of Shreveport. I mean, I want the police to police. I don't want them to tell me what to wear and that I'm wrong about it. So that is my reasoning, that is my rationale behind not supporting this, and that's just the way I feel. It's nothing personal toward uh, Commissioner Williams. It would be nothing personal toward any commissioner here that um, would put something forward like that. If I don't believe in it, I just don't believe in it, and I have the right to oppose it. Thank you so much. 
So I remind all commissioners, this is not on the agenda, so I hope we don't get to any long discussion over this. I just want to close. Mr. Williams, I got you on that. I'll close. I respectfully respect every commissioner up here. If you had something, even if I were against it, I would still allow you the proper protocol for it to go through the channels. I had the opportunity to serve as president at 38 years old, very young. Back then, we had, the commission was in chaos. And the commission yesterday and I had broke the ranks and brought and united this commission together. I think the chair ought to be able to unite this commission together. When you see their division in the house, we need to be able to have the quorum, whereas we have proper protocol in a work session. And I was under the impression, I don't want to be hoodwinked or bamboozled or undermined in thinking that I had some on the agenda that would allow proper protocol, have a public hearing, let the people say, vote it up or vote it down. But the people ought to be able to have input on something that's going to affect their life, whether it's good or bad. They ought to have a say, say that. That's all I'm saying. I wouldn't do it to you. I respect the same professional commission of courtesy that I would give you back in return. And I hope that we'll revisit this one day. We just need to find out how we get there, maybe through a resolution, if not law. So I appreciate your support. If, if we find a way to, to agree to have a public letter writing campaign to as a resolution, and I hope you guys will support that because it's not a law. All the same to the private companies, please have some type of dress code because you do lose business when you have people that are non-conforming to the laws of our country. And people that have the resources to buy sometimes leave the store. So hopefully, um, if not policy, hope we have a resolution in the future. And I appreciate, I will give with you guys on that in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have President's report. I don't have anything. Next we adopt the minutes of the regular meeting held on February the 9th. So moved. Second. Okay. Moved by Mr. Dominic. Second by Mr. Lynn. Cast your vote, please. Mr. Ken said draw. <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, just always put Ms. Bobin as a second. <laughs> no matter who said it. Just <clears throat> okay, that, that passes. Next, we move to public hearing on ordinances. Ordinance number 5174 of 2012, amending the budget of estimate revenues and expenditures for the Riverboat Fund in the amount of 40000 for the C.C. Antoine Black History Empowerment Plan for the year 2012. I second Ms. Bobin's motion. Yes, All right, do we have any... Uh, any speakers for or against ordinance number 5174 for this public hearing? All right, it's closed. We, next one, please. Ordinance number 5175 of 2012, amending and reenacting chapter 26, section 26 185 of the Cattle Parish Code of Ordinances to add the streets of Stoyer Circle to the list of stop intersections. Do we have any speakers for or against this? Uh, Ordinance 5175. Seeing none, call that one closed also. Ordinance number 5176 to accept the streets in Fort Worth Oaks Unit 3 into the Parish of Caddo system. Any speakers for or against 5176? Seeing none, we'll call that closed. Ordinance number 5177 of 2012 to accept the streets in Fort Worth Oaks Unit 4 into the Parish of Caddo system. Anyone in favor or against 5177? That public hearing is closed. Ordinance number 5178 of 2012 to revoke a portion of dedication of an unnamed road in the parish of Caddo. Any speakers for or against 5178? Public hearing is closed. Ordinance number 5179 of 2012 to revoke the dedication of an unnamed road in the parish of Caddo. Any speakers for or against 5179? Seeing none, that is closed. That'll conclude our public hearing on ordinances. We move to ordinances for final passage. Ordinance number 5174 of 2012, amending the budget of estimate revenues and expenditures for the Riverboat Fund and the amount of 40000 for the C.C. Antoine Black History Empowerment Plan. So moved. Second. Okay, before, we, uh, before we vote, I want to remind everybody that for ordinances, all seven of us will have to vote in favor since uh, it takes a, a, a majority of the full commission. So there are I think seven of us here, so just want to remind everybody of that. Uh, Ms. Bowman? 
Uh, yes, sir. I certainly want to mention uh, Commissioner Cox is not here, and he is the one that had this placed on the agenda. I do support it um, because if we can recall, uh, Mr. Lee came before us on numerous occasions right after I first came on board, and we had promised him basically that we would um, support his uh, his efforts. Apparently, something wasn't done right. It didn't end up in the budget. We met in our committee meeting and um, uh, decided to, um, you know, go back and try to uh, bring it forward again. So that's where we are, and that's how we end up. I'm sorry. The acceptance from the state, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> it was what? It, it was something waiting on something from the state. Yeah. Okay. I knew it was something that didn't happen, and then it mm -hmm. went through the committee, and now back here, and um, that's where we are. So I do support it. Okay, Mr. Dominic. I moved the logo ordinances number 5174, 5175, 5176, right, yeah. 5177, 5178, and 5179 for final passage. Second one, one more. Right. 5181. Eighty screen. Oh, that's it. Okay, okay. You got it, Johnson. We've got a motion by Mr. Dominic to engulf over the rest of the ordinances and a second by. Hello. Uh, <laughs> second by Mr. Escobar. <laughs> Any speakers? Mr. Oak, please. Mr. President, just Adam, the, I noticed the public hearings ran through Ordinance 5179, but 5181 is also... Introductory sentence, that's about title. I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. That's about title. Wait up. All right. Got it, Ray. Okay. Cash vote, please. Unanimous. Seven is up. Next we move to ordinances for introduction. Ordinance number... 5181 of 2012 to revoke the dedication of the unnamed road in the parish of Prado. <clears throat> move to work. Uh, our work session minutes are not complete yet, so we'll move that for the next meeting. We'll move to resolutions. Resolution number 11 of 2012 committing certain monies to pay engineering and emission fees associated <coughs> with the LCDBG application for the Belle de Gill Water Project in North Cattle Parish. So move to move. Second. Moved by Mr. Dominic, second by Ms. Bowman. Either of you have comments? Um, yeah, I'll briefly okay. say this is the one, this resolution, uh, Mr. Willie Washington has come before several times. This is um, the one that's seeking um, water to be run out in the rural areas of, in the Blanchard area uh, to fund about 72 homes in that area. Uh, primarily lower income families. The parish received an LCDBG block grant. I think it was three or four hundred thousand dollars. Representative Smith, Jane Smith at the time was able to get two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for this project. <coughs> it's short about thirty eight thousand dollars. If you read the resolution it, it refers to thirty eight thousand seven hundred dollars and ninety thousand five hundred dollars. The ninety thousand five hundred dollars comes from the Louisiana Community Water Enrichment Fund, which is the amount of money that we received from um, Representative Jane Smith's efforts. The parish will be coming out with the $38,700 to uh, complete this project. I would ask everybody to please support this. We can either do it now, come up with $38,700, or when we do the water project three or four or five years down the road, we're going to be coming up by $700,000. So it's it this seems for like your, that. This for your district? Yes. You need my vote? Today, right? No, I don't need your vote. Yeah. Okay, we'll I'd see. I'd like to have it, but okay, we'll see. <laughs> I'd like to have it. Okay, this is for your district, correct? Yes. All right. Wow. Okay. Dash your vote, please. It fails. Six to one. Wait, the resolution. Resolution. It's a resolution. Oh, it's a resolution. Fails. It's still fails. 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 The resolution. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Has to have seven? Yes, yep. sir. Yep. When does this have to be? Uh, we needed it to, for tomorrow. Because we're going to, if we don't have this resolution, then we lose all the funding opportunity to get to the $700,000 for the grant. I 
Yeah. <clears throat> Just one minute. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to it. Looks like well, we have to wait. We need, we need to have seven votes. We're going to take about a five minute break. Present. Eleven. We consider for a vote. Cast your vote for our reconsideration. Uh, we need a second. Second. We need a second. Second. All right, we got it. Mr. Glenn, second. Cast your vote for reconsideration. Okay, that passes. All right, now. We need to vote on it. Now we will vote on the resolution. So moved. Second. And moved by Mr. Dominic, second by Mr. Williams. Cast your vote, please. Seven zero. That passes. All right. Next, Next we have resolution number twelve of twenty twelve, supporting Commissioner Lindor Baker's appointment as chairperson of NACO's Economic Development Subcommittee. So moved. Second. You can't second. Second by. Second by. Second by. Second by. Second by. Second You're already on there automatically on everything. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Cash your vote, please. That fails. Okay. Okay. Uh, you want to talk? Mr. Um, I'm not talking. Mr. President, talk about. I have a question. I have to button. All right, Mr. Bowman. Even though it fails, she's still. Yeah, I'm still. She's still on it. Chair. Right, mm -hmm. and I just um, wanted to ask the question. It says. Uh, Resolution number 12 of 2012 supporting Commissioner Lindor Baker's appointment, which means she's already been already appointed been. as yeah. the chairperson right. of NACO's Economic Development Subcommittee. Right. So we'll, the next time we meet, this uh, we can have this put back on and... Uh, if someone because this is not it, something like what I'm is needed for uh, tomorrow, if, correct? If someone no. would like to put it back on, we're not doing it today. Yeah, yeah. We can back go back on the next step. Uh, right. Okay. That's fine. The chair, Let's move on. Mr. Chairman, I would like to uh, make a motion to reconsider my vote. Mm -hmm. Clean games. You don't have to. I second it. Thank you. I have Mr. Lennon on here first. I was going to congratulate you on already receiving that appointment, Lindora. Thank you so much. That's okay. Chairman, vote for reconsideration on all the resolution. Cash to vote, please. So if I hit no, we won't be able to reconsider? You congratulated me. Can I hit no, really? I have Miss Baker hit no, so. Okay, you're not congratulated. Thank you. All right, let's move on. Next, we move to do business. Confirmation for reappointment of Mr. Edward Angel to the Cattle Parish Fire District Number Two. Term expired on January 1, so moved. 2012. Okay. Second. I will move that uh, motion to reconsider passed. Six to one. The motion only requires six votes. Three fourths to reconsider, or two thirds. I have motion. Two thirds. I have motion. We're good. We're good. Uh, Mr. Dominic. I move to englobo the confirmation for the reappointment of Mr. Edward Angel, Mr. Harry Lowry, Mr. Gordon Roundtree, and also to con uh, confirm the travel of Commissioner Eskaday. I would englobo the new Move by Mr. Williams. Uh, uh, moved by Mr. Uh, Dominic, second by Mr. Williams. Catch your vote, please. I need one more vote. Uh, I got seven. It passes. Move to adjourn. We're adjourned.